it's uh, 6.15, so um, I'll formally open the cabinet meeting. Welcome to uh, members and members of the public. Um, just go through the preliminary items. Item 1 is members code of conduct. Are any members of the cabinet there any interest? Any?
protecting vulnerable people, narrowing the inequality gap, and economic growth. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that we've, we've been able to fund particularly some of those important children's and adult services, so maybe seven million, um, to make, make sure we deal with the uh, demands from demographic growth that we've, we've talked about many times on the cabinet previously. There's, there's funding in there to improve um, our housing uh, offer and particularly in the private rented sector. Uh, I think the selective licensing scheme which we're rolling out, starting to roll out throughout the borough will be a, a major um, move forward in terms of, of that particular sector. And um, the house building programme, capital funding we put in the budget last year is, is starting to uh, be delivered, uh, which I think is, is um, excellent. And then in terms of economic growth, help to uh, businesses, um, investment in our infrastructure um, and in our highways, uh, I think are all very welcome. And the, the new LED lighting programme, I think will be a major in terms of reducing our carbon footprint, but also uh, improving the quality of, of, of lighting in the borough. Um, I also on page two now uh, highlight the fact that we have um, uh, been able to honour the National Pay Award for our staff, uh, some 2.5 million in the budget to do that, and very importantly, in the light of you know some uh, fairly horrendous reports recently in other areas, we are putting growth in to increase the pay of our social workers because I firmly believe that safeguarding is the number one priority of this level of quality need to make sure that we've got um, the skills within our social work staff and we retain those social workers in Wirral and don't lose them to other borough So I'm delighted we're putting them 400,000 um, in 1569 to 800,000 by 1718 to increase the, the pay for our social workers. Um, paragraph 4 goes on to talk about um, the revenue support grants. Um, we, we have uh, got a little bit more room for manoeuvre on that than we thought, um, some 640,000, but that is in the context of a £24 million pound cut in, in our overall revenue support grants for 15 16. So, um, you know, that needs to be tempered against the overall um, cut that we've seen in our grant for next year. And um, welcome, that is welcome, and, and I acknowledge that. And I'm, I'm, in the paragraphs that follow, I'm just going to briefly uh, outline how we intend to allocate that 1.5 million, uh, which is available for 1516. I think um, many, many members, I'm sure, will, will recognise and agree that antisocial behaviour is an absolutely huge issue in many of our communities uh, throughout the borough. And I think uh, I certainly been. Um, uh, at my advice surgeries, public meetings, etc., uh, receiving petitions and letters saying we need to really crack down on antisocial behaviour because it is a scourge of many communities. It is always the irresponsible minority that are ruining it for the, for the vast majority. And so we've recognised this in our budget by putting together, I think, a really comprehensive package of some 365,000 uh, to tackle uh, antisocial behaviour. And very briefly, that's made up of, of a number of elements. Firstly, we're going to beef up our, uh, our antisocial behaviour team. Um, we're going to employ an additional two antisocial behaviour officers, which will mean we'll have in total eight antisocial behaviour officers. And my recommendation to Cabinet is we have two uh, dedicated antisocial behaviour officers per constituency committee. I'm very keen to devolve as much as we can to constituency committees. And I think that is a um, that is a good resource that will work. We'll need to work clearly, most importantly, with the police um, to to make sure that we can resolve um, issues with antisocial behaviour. So uh, that's the first element of the package. Second element of the package is we often get um, uh, issues with antisocial behaviour, noise, particularly uh, outside office hours, and we we've been struggling in the past to resource that through our environmental health team. Uh, we are proposing to put extra money into the budget, 30,000 next year, to provide an out of hours service for complaints about antisocial behaviour. Um, and we'll, we'll have an environmental health office on standby for those complaints that we receive out of hours, which I think is, is, is really good. Third element is to uh, recognise the neighbourhood justice scheme that operates in the world. It's formally announced 
last year by the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner, Jane Kennedy, is, is, is going to try and test the method of reducing antisocial behaviour. And um, we have struggled to resource it properly in the world. So this is the, the whole approach to restorative justice um, that many members will be familiar with, uh, where we, um, we basically uh, bring the, the perpetrator and the victim together and agree a, um, uh, a way forward in terms of compensation or action to recognise the damage and upset and stress and hurt that's been done to the, to the victim. All the evidence shows that restorative justice does uh, reduce real um, So we need to uh, increase the, uh, the strength of the team that, that does that. And the suggestion is that we put 45,000 into the budget to second a police officer to the community, our community safety team to really, uh, really take that whole neighborhood justice um, uh, scheme forward. Um, Next element, again building on the, the need to support victims of antisocial behaviour, we're putting 20,000 into a fund to engage the services of victim mediation, so victim support mediation service, uh, working directly with victims of antisocial behaviour, um, and, and again, hopefully, uh, just providing far more help support for the people on the receiving end of this, of this issue. Um, next item is we, we've got, uh, we've had really good uh, uh, evidence from the, something called the Stay Safe Operation, which is operated in uh, in for, for some years now, where we saturate an area with police officers, environmental health officers, etc. A hotspot, antisocial behaviour hotspot for uh, a couple of days. Um, we're proposing that we uh, put uh, some 35,200 into the budget to enable us to fund an additional four stay safe operations in each constituency area over the next 12 months. Um, next item is something again that I know that members get asked all the time for is additional CCTV cameras uh, because you need that evidence to, uh, to catch the perpetrators so we are putting 100,000 into the budget for next year to fund additional CCTV cameras and other equipment to make sure we've got the evidence to be able to prosecute the perpetrators of antisocial behaviour. We're also proposing, uh, next item down, £100,000 to uh, make sure that we are, we, we kind of uh, upgrade and reintroduce the monitoring of, of our own CCTV cameras um, uh, in the control room of Cheshire Lines, which will, which will mean employing additional staff to monitor those cameras, so that's uh, a further £100,000. And then finally, um, I, I do believe, and this is a theme throughout our budget resolution uh, tonight, um, the constituency committee should be given more funding um, to tackle these kind of issues. So the proposal is that we um, make available £60,000 for next year, £15,000 per constituency committee, for the constituency committees to come up with their own um, ideas about tackling antisocial behaviour. And that could be anything from um, additional youth provision, sports, sports development workers, etc. Um, uh, they will need to decide what is the, the best um, solution for their own areas. So that is an extra 60,000 for, uh, for the constituency committees. So I believe that is a, that is a as big a package as I remember <coughs> on my time in the council that we've, uh, we've added to the, uh, the effort to uh, tackle this, this problem and, you know, I, I really do believe that we have got a plan now, a clear plan about how we're going to tackle what I think is the number one complaint we get now as, as uh, councillors. Uh, and I look forward to seeing the impact of this. I think it is important that we do evaluate the impact so that by the end of the year we can actually hopefully demonstrate that we've made a, a significant uh, uh, attempt at reducing the level of antisocial behaviour in the world. So there's a, there's a line in, in the resolution to say that we need to build in an evaluation um, as part of this package of antisocial behaviour measures. Okay, um, so moving on um, to page five. One, one, of the, uh, um, one of the issues that we've had to deal with over the last few years is um, as the, austerity, the government's austerity program has really kicked in, <coughs> Um, the need to really help people literally in dire need, um, uh, either because they're unemployed or they've, um, they've 
have lost their houses and bedroom tax, etc. Um, and we, we were given responsibility from the DWP to administer something called the Local Welfare Assistance Fund. Um, uh, and we've done that to the best of our abilities over the last kind of year, 18 months. Uh, unfortunately, the government announced that the grants that, that they were applying for this was coming to an end uh, with effect from March of this year. So um, we face the prospect of not having any, any funding to uh, continue this vital work for our, some of our poorest in the uh, community. So we are proposing uh, that we use the following money to, money to uh, continue a local welfare assistance fund. We've got £600,000 that we've got in a reserve, which I'm proposing that we use <coughs> next year, together with, we've got a um, small understanding of about 300,000 to create a total pot, total fund of 900,000 available in 15, 16, uh, to fill the gap that the government left by cutting this grant completely. My proposal is that we ask a, the scrutiny review group that's been set up to look at how we administer this money, led by um, uh, Councillor Jeanette Williamson, that we ask the scrutiny review group to uh, use this 900,000 to, to give us recommendations about how this 900,000 can best be used. And I'd like them to meet as soon as possible <coughs> to, to do that work. Um, the, uh, the, in, the in the meantime, the, the, my proposal is that we continue the current policy until the end of July, by which time hopefully the scrutiny review group will have met and made recommendations about how we administer the scheme going forward after that. But I do not believe it is acceptable not to provide any assistance at all for some of the, you know, the really needy people that this money has been out of in the past. So that's uh, that proposal. And the next one on page five is something literally I, I only just found out today, but I think absolutely scandalously the government have announced that they're cutting our discretionary housing payment grants by 300,000, by almost 300,000 next year. Now that money is used to help particularly the people on the uh, receiving end of the bedroom tax. And we've used that money quite uh, successfully, I think, to make sure that those people who are literally being forced out of their homes are not left homeless. Um, so I think it's outrageous. I really do think it's outrageous that they've, they've cut this money. And I, I do not believe it, it's, it, it's acceptable for us to leave those people uh, take people in those circumstances literally without a roof over their heads. So my proposal is that we put 300,000 in, back into the budget so that the, the cut that the government have announced in the last few days is, is not, um, you know, is not, uh, uh, doesn't cause major problems in the borough. So uh, that 300,000 will enable us to keep the discretionary housing payment fund at the, uh, at the current level. Um, uh, to bridge the gap by what I've called in this resolution uh, a misguided decision. I, I genuinely believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, moving on, another, another major issue that is becoming increasingly uh, a problem across the borough is um, dog fouling. Uh, and again, uh, it, I, I think to show that we're a listening council, a listening cabinet, we're proposing that we put 102,500 into the budget to appoint additional dog wardens. Um, this will basically enable us to um, uh, have uh, uh, a further four um, enforcement officers of four dog wardens, which again, a bit like the antisocial behaviour team, will have two dedicated dog wardens per constituency area. Now, I'd like that. But I'd like that resource to be operated flexibly, so if there is a particular problem in a particular constituency, I want, I'd like the flexibility to be able to use some of those dog wardens to go into that area and have a real um, kind of clamp down, if you like. And, and frankly, I, I, I think we, I have a personal view, but I strongly believe this, we need more prosecutions yeah. as an example, um, because it is not acceptable for people to let their their dog to, to foul an area, it just causes misery for the local community and it's, it's a health hazard <coughs> as well. So I think this is a good um, contribution to, to that real real issue that I know uh, many members uh, have to deal with uh, on a regular basis. So, so that's, um, that's that one. Right, so moving on to page six, there's um, a couple of, 
uh, items here from our uh, relevant to our arts and cultural industries. <coughs> First one is the Williamson Art Gallery, which uh, we've discussed many times at Cabinet and Council over the last few months. I want to make clear um, in this resolution that I personally believe, I don't mean that my group believes that the Williamson Art Gallery is a, a, a vital element of our cultural offer. Um, I want to pay tribute to the work that Councillor Chris Beaton has done as a cabinet member, working with um, particularly the Friends Group, uh, Friends of the Williamson. Um, and we put together, I think, quite a, 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 a good package where we, we, are, we are saying in this resolution we will put a quarter of a million into the budget for next year to make sure the Williamson <coughs> remain open. I think that's the main thing. So I know there have been a number of people who have been um, uh, claiming that we're going to close the Williamson. So we will not close the Williamson, we, we will keep, keep that open, that money will keep the Williamson open. But we, we will all, we will also be working with the uh, National Museum of Liverpool to hopefully uh, agree a service level agreement with them to put some management expertise into the Williamson. Um, we will continue to make only assets, I want to make that clear. But I think what the NNL can bring is expertise and also they can bring collections from elsewhere in their, in their portfolio. We know that they do a good job in running the Lady Beaver, for example, and I'm sure that they will be, uh, uh, they will be add to the, uh, the offer of Williamson. In the longer term, uh, I'm very keen to look at new service delivery models um, here, uh, not for Williamson, but for other. Um, for other uh, of our arts and cultural industries assets. And um, I know the, the Friends groups and the, uh, uh, the supporters of the Williamson are working with us and are equally interested in some of other models around, um, around trusts. So I'd like us, uh, just put this down as a marker, to, to work with the, the Friends group and just to look at um, whether it would make sense to, as a business case, for transferring um, Williamson and other assets to a, 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 a trust or a, a new model of, of service delivery. That's still to be decided. We need a further report on that. But I want to reassure everybody so that Williamson Art Gallery is, is safe in our hands. Right, moving on to the Forum Pavilion. Again, uh, a fantastic resource, fantastic facility <coughs> in Brighton, uh, and, and really um, benefiting from that the renaissance which we've seen in Brighton over the last few years. Um, we, we have a challenge, I think, to make the Williamson commercially self-sufficient. Um, we've, we've, um, we've been reducing the subsidy uh, gradually over the last uh, year or so. Uh, we still need to make further progress on that. We're putting 200,000 uh, into the, uh, the, the floor for next year to give, to give them a, um, uh, you know, a, a sound platform to continue operating, but I want that to go hand in hand with um, work to uh, develop a, a business plan so that they can become um, self-sufficient, hopefully within the next 12 months, but um, um, we'll, we'll wait and see if we need a further report, but again, um, this is a, this is a um, money we'll put in, extra money we'll put in the budget to make sure that we can continue to provide that high quality facility at the floor, but I do think Again, that might, the floor might be one of those facilities that we think about putting into a trust in future years, but again, we need a further report back on that. Um, and penultimately, I mentioned the constituency committees earlier on in the, um, in, in the presentation. Um, I, I, I think, you know, first, personal view, I think the constituency committees are really stuck. They are starting to um, become more effective in terms of providing uh, more uh, devolution to uh, constituency areas and the, the neighbourhoods within the constituencies. Uh, they're enabling uh, local uh, residents to, to get more involved in deciding what are the priorities in each area. When we started this policy in 13, we pulled seed corn funding of 50,000 um, and we, we, you know, that was put in on the basis that other public agencies would also put money into the pot. Uh, I've got to say, I've been disappointed that that's not happened yet. I think we need to redouble a lot of efforts to get the public, public agencies to, um, you know, to step up to the plate in terms of uh, helping the decisions and committees. However, having said that, I think it would be, it would be um, slightly odd if we continued 
this policy. So my proposal is we put 50, that we continue the 50,000 of CCORN funding. We ask our acting chief exec to, to do an evaluation of the constituency committees to report back to cabinet on what additional um, powers we can develop and functions we can develop to the constituency committees. Um, and the, I'm just putting a marker down in this in this resolution. I would I think we need to see evidence because they were set up these constituency, constituency committees, particularly to address poverty and deprivation in the borough. And I'd like to see evidence that that's happening. And I also put down a marker that I want to leave us with the uh, the option of of changing the weighting of the funding that goes to constituency committees in future years. So that those areas with the higher, highest levels of deprivation get get more money, earn more affluent areas. I think that's entirely our consistent with our corporate priority of reducing the inequalities gap. So um, it's fifty thousand this year, but I definitely, as part of the review, want to look at wasting that money in future years to tackle deprivation. Now, so that's the seed corn uh, money, but on top of that fifty thousand. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, the top of page 7, we're also allocating 60,000, 15,000 to each constituency committee for anti-social behaviour. And later on in the, um, in the agenda, I'll also mention a proposal to develop a community cleanup fund of 40,000, 10,000 per constituency um, to help improve the cleanliness of the, uh, of the streets and the street scene. Constituency areas. So each constituency committee should have 50,000 uh, seed call money, 15,000 uh, anti social behaviour money, and 10,000 community cleanup money. Um, so a pot of 75,000 per constituency committee, which I think is a significant improvement on the level of funding that each of the constituency committees will, will have had in previous years. And I think that demonstrates. Our commitment to making sure this model has actually got the, the funding as well as the, uh, the organisation to uh, deliver the devolution to our communities. Right, and then the final item in terms of how we're going to allocate the 1.5 million I mentioned right at the start is I, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that Rural Council is one of the first councils to pay the living wage to all our staff. I believe we need to go further now and start um, asking our businesses to step up to the place uh, on a living wage. I've been very attracted by the model that's operated elsewhere in the country. There's two London boroughs grants and grants that are offering discounts on their business rates um, for businesses that adopt the living wage, pay the living wage to their staff. So I am proposing that we adopt a similar uh, uh, approach and that we, uh, we put £50,000 into a pot uh, to provide business rate flexibilities to um, give employers an incentive to pay the living wage. The way the funding works, we are hopeful that we'll be able to get that matched by the government to make it part of 100,000. <coughs> and my recommendation is that we focus that money on the smaller companies, the smaller and medium sized enterprises. I think we could really need to do with that way and really uh, make, it, make it work for them. And, um, uh, I, I'd like the um, uh, I'd like a report to come to cabinet to uh, set out the kind of mechanics of how that would actually work. But hopefully, a, a pot of about hundred thousand would be able to um, entice, attract, persuade uh, um, many small and medium-sized businesses to pay their staff the living wage. And <coughs> this is the, the next step in our journey, I think, if you like. Um, I've said many times I'm proud of the fact that the living wage council. Now to be, need to become a living wage borough, and I think this is another um, uh, tool in the toolbox, if you like, that will enable us to um, spread the living wage message to our private sector colleagues as well as the uh, as well as the council. So that's um, my proposal around the living wage. Okay, so that that's the, the 1.5 million. The next section of the of the resolution from paragraph five onwards is some further growth items funded from other sources. I'll just briefly um, uh, take you through those, those items if you bear with me. One of the um, key issues that again I think the uh, administration has been grappling with over the last year is parking charges, car parking charges. Now 
Uh, again, we've debated this many times. I've been concerned that we've not really had in the past a coherent strategy and policy as to what we, why we charge, what we charge um, for parking in the borough. Um, and, and to that end, we, we, we asked the, scrutiny, the um, scrutiny committee to set up a scrutiny review around this, led by Councillor Paul Dancy. And then they've been beaming away over the last year and produced, um, many of you have seen the report that we've produced, it's, it's come to the cabinet um, uh, in the previous meeting. My proposal is that we, um, we support the recommendations that the scrutiny review committee uh, came up with. Um, and the, uh, the budget resolution, page 7 and page 8, sets out how we are intending to do that. So, essentially, uh, we are proposing that we reduce car parking charges in the next financial year for a trial period of 12 months. Um, in those uh, car parks that um, uh, uh, what we call uh, shopper car parks, uh, mainly in we are going to reduce the charges, and, and I think one of the main complaints I hear about parking in Birkenhead is this is this 5p uh, element of the charge, which I, I don't know how many times I've had residents complain to me about having to find the odd 5p. So we're, we're going to reduce the charges there, get rid of the 5p denomination, which I, I hope will, uh, uh, will, will help uh, residents in, who have to use those car parks. Second element of this policy is we've had a number of complaints and representations over the last year from businesses in the outer, uh, what I call the outer shopping centres, uh, notably Heswell um, and West Kirby and Walsey, um, around <coughs> the whole issue of parking charges. So, to give you an example, I, I think it's that, frankly, we've had a situation in Walsey, I mentioned Liscard. Um, uh, Bernie is an unchill ward, but uh, you know, I just think it's crazy that we've had the Cherry Tree Centre, which is a privately run car park funded by the businesses, operating lower parking charges than the municipal car park, literally a, a couple of hundred yards away. You know, that, that just is, is crazy, and it, and it means we're not, gener you know, we're not generating revenue there. So, the proposal in, in the second part of this resolution, again in line with the recommendations of the Scrutiny Committee, is that we um, reduce the council parking charges to the, to the rates, the parking tariffs in, in the Liscard car park, the private car park, for all these outer, um, outer, outer uh, shopping districts. So the, the, the car parks are listed in the, in the table on page 8. Um, and I think this, is a, this will be a direct, I'm hoping this will be a direct help to businesses. Um, in those areas that may, I know make representations to Stuart Whitting and Mark Allen and to myself and to all the members. Um, and I think this will be a, a, a huge um, move forward and will help hopefully attract more footfall to those, those shopping centres. I'm, I'm also very keen that we work with those businesses. I'm, I'm attracted to the scheme, for example, that ASTA operates in Birkenhead where you get your car parking charges refunded if you spend over of a certain amount of money in the, in the shops, and I'd like other businesses to consider that kind of um, proposal. Obviously, it may not be the same as Asda, but that seems to be a direct way in which businesses can contribute and hopefully get more more footfall into, into their businesses. So um, the other the other element of this is we want to um, progress the testing of new technologies such as the phone to pay. Um, <clears throat> the phone to pay scheme, so you can book your car parking online, and all of that will mean that we've, we think we'll have an anticipated reduction in the income of 330,000 uh, from those changes. That's obviously um, uh, an issue we need to address. I'm suggesting that this year, for this trial, we, um, we, we find that money from balances, but we need to do an evaluation. Uh, before the end of the year, the impact of those changes. But this is a direct <coughs> response to businesses, and I hope it will be well received by those businesses who have made representations. Okay, um, and, the, and the, 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 the other element that we'll be funding from, from outside the 1.5 million is the top of page 9. Again, um, 
we've run this in this council over the last few years quite a successful apprenticeship program. Um, we've had um, I think 11 apprenticeship places, 11 or 12 apprenticeship places, um, which again I'm proud of the fact that we paid a living wage for those apprenticeship uh, apprentices. A lot of those people come to the end of their time now that uh, they've completed their apprenticeship. And uh, certainly representations have been made to us to continue that apprenticeship programme. I'm delighted that we'll be able to find, find money from Children and People's Department to enable that apprenticeship programme to continue so that the 218,000 to continue to fund 12 apprenticeship places at, co at, at that cost. I'd like us to be able to do more in future years, but at the very least, at least we will continue that very successful programme uh, and we will continue to pay them living wage. So that is the uh, proposal in that, um, in, in that uh, paragraph. Final section of the of the budget resolution uh, deals with creating a cleaner and greener borough. Um, we have an opportunity, I believe, through uh, the waste development or sinking funds, as it's called, which is money that's been returned, which we've paid over the years to the uh, the uh, Merseyside uh, Waste Authority. Um, we have an opportunity now to use that money, providing, and this is the key. Uh, issue that we can demonstrate that it's meeting um, the targets and the priorities in our waste uh, strategy. Um, and the advice very strongly uh, has been that we shouldn't use all this money in one go, primarily because from 2017 onwards uh, the landscape is likely to change dramatically uh, when we have a new, we will probably be re replacing the fleet. Um, uh, that we're operating at the moment and will pro probably, uh, details of the uh, be looking at a much bigger, wider offer, for example, uh, around um, uh, uh, food waste, collecting food waste separately. So we need to allow, allow leave some money in this particular part to pay for the infrastructure that we'll need to buy when, we, uh, when this, the, these changes take place in 2017. Um, the other advice. Is that the, the, uh, any money we spend from the sinking fund goes on sustainable outcomes. And we absolutely need to prioritise recycling because by 2020, we need to, uh, the target is we need to recycle 50% of our waste. So we need to come up with sustainable um, projects that will be enable us to achieve the 2020 target. So, very briefly, the suggestions from page 9 onwards about how we might use some of this money are as follows. Uh, we have a big issue, and, and you know, Councillor Birmingham is our cabinet member who has been uh, uh, dealing with a lot, lots of these, these, uh, these uh, topics. But we have a big issue with um, grain bins that are lost, stolen, or damaged. Uh, as it says here, it's estimated that 4,000 households do not have um, grain bins. <coughs> and clearly, if we're trying to look at our recycling rate, our recycling rate is quite respectable, it's about 37 38%, but we could do more. Um, we need to we need to encourage and incentivise people to replace the grain bins that go um, go missing. So the proposal here is that we actually um, uh, whereas the moment we charge thirty seven pounds for replacement grain bin, these will be replaced for, uh, replaced for free um, uh, from now on or from April. So I think that's a, a really good move forward and enable us to up our recycling rates. Uh, the second item going on top page ten. Um, we, we know the evidence shows that people are, are paying for replacement green bins, but I think the £37 of pounds, pounds charging is out of kilter with uh, other authorities. The recommendation uh, here is that we reduce the charge from £37 pounds to £24, pounds, which will hopefully make it more affordable um, for households who, for whatever reason, uh, have to replace their, their green bin. And you can see that. Uh, cost over two year period is 80,000. Bin repair service, um, over the last 18 months, uh, we've saved taxpayers 44,000 by um, repairing 1,200 bins. It's proposed that this service is, is offered free of charge to residents over the next two years at a cost of 45,000. Um, item D is uh, we have, a, we have a ch an issue in many households. Uh, a number of households don't separate the uh, different recycling items inside the house, which
which means quite often that when they put rubbish out in the wheeling bins, they put the wrong items in the wrong bins, and then we, we have to send out warning letters, etc. Uh, the uh, recommendation here is that we we trial reusable bags for use within households so they can separate the rubbish in the house, inside the house. So that I think makes the the, the, um, the likelihood of them putting the correct items in the recycle in the recycling bin in the green bin uh, higher than if, if we don't get them to separate the, the items inside the house. So that so that will and we need we're, we're proposing a kind of publicity campaign around that as well. So there's money in the budget from the sinking fund to do that over the next few years. And hopefully again, hopefully it's sustainable because once you've got people into the habit of recycling correctly, then hopefully that, that will continue. Um, item A is building on the need for education because I, I believe to say a lot of this is about education. The proposal is that we employ four new neighbor recycling officers to you know to really um, help uh, communities, residents with um, uh, recycling um, which, uh, again, I think uh, if, if they can change the mindset, change um, behaviours, uh, that will make a major contribution to helping us meet our uh, 2020 recycling target of 50%. Again, putting money in the budget for seven and over two years. Finally, in terms of clean and greener, um, uh, we're, I think I've trailed this earlier on. Um, We've, we've had really good experience actually with uh, the last year, 18 months, with community cleanups. This is where we provide free skips um, and residents and other partners um, go into a particular street uh, for, for a day or a couple of days and um, basically you know, do a blitz on, on flight etc. etc. Uh, this is very popular. And actually, I mean, I've done this myself in my life. It does bring the community together and you meet neighbours and people maybe have never met before. And because you've contributed to keeping the, clean, the street clean, it tends to stay clean rather than if it's done by, by somebody else. So again, it, it, in an effort to try and um, provide more opportunities for constituency committees, the proposal here is that we give the, each of the constituency committee £10,000 um, to a total of 40000 to do community cleanups, um, which uh, I think will, will uh, improve the standard and cleanliness um, in, in many of our uh, in many of our communities. So um, to summarise what we're doing with this money from the waste of poverty, um, the, these initiatives, if you add the four hundred thousand that we put into the budget last year to increase the frequency of collecting rubbish from alleyways, and the uh, the money we put in the budget I mentioned earlier on for additional dollars. <coughs> We're spending about 1.2 million of the sinking fund on these um, uh, environmental initiatives. That leaves around 5 million, which the advice from, that I've had from uh, offices is we need to leave um, that amount of money into the budget so that we've got the uh, wherewithal to move to the, um, the uh, changes in, in uh, uh, waste collection post 2017. Uh, that I, I mentioned earlier on. So, uh, whilst this is a sensible investment, we're not putting all the money in one go again. We've got no money uh, in 2017 to uh, invest in the uh, changes. Uh, and I think that's a prudent approach to uh, spending this money. Um, right, so, uh, final point I wanted to make, and apologies for taking so long to go through this uh, resolution, is um, you know, the, the, we had a big We've had a big um, sort of issue over the last few years about council tax levels in this borough. Um, I was pleased that we were able to freeze the council tax last year, this year, 14 15. Um, I mean, I'm still of the view, uh, I think my group's still of the view, that uh, many, many families and individuals in the are struggling with the cost of living. Energy bills are going up, uh, household goods are going up, um, and the council tax bill is still one of the biggest bills that people. Fine. Um, and I believe that given those circumstances, I think it is sensible for, to, for us to freeze the council tax for another year. So um, the proposal in this resolution is that we do just that and that we um, uh, will be at a zero, a zero increase for 15, 16. And I think um, freezing the council tax for two years on the run is a, is a really uh, good contribution that the council can make to 
help people cope with what I think is a cost of living crisis that many families have to deal with. Uh, so, um, so that's the, uh, the other key proposal in this budget resolution. The rest of the resolution talks about future years. We do need to look at new models of service delivery because to remind Cabinet, we've got 70 million more cuts to make over the next three years. Um, we, so we need to uh, really step up the pace in terms of looking at more innovative ways of delivering our typical frontline services, yet still meeting those um, budget reduction targets. And uh, finally, I'm uh, proposing that we review our corporate plan much earlier uh, in the new municipal year in July, because um, that then can set the scene, if you like, for the budget um, for future years. We almost need, you know, we're now in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the habit of almost starting the new budget when we when we set the budget for, for next year. So we'll have a new corporate plan, a new three-year corporate plan uh, in July, taking us to, to, to 2019. Final point to make um, in this budget resolution is um, I, I sincerely believe that um, this, is a, this is a good budget for the people of Brooklyn. We've been able to maintain frontline services. We've been able to demonstrate that we're tackling some of the big issues that we get residents' um, uh, uh, representations about antisocial behaviour, particularly, uh, it's the most ambitious package that I've seen for tackling antisocial behaviour um, in all my years on the council. And we're also helping businesses, uh, and we're also protecting our cultural facilities, and we're doing, we're making a, a big move forward, I believe, in um, uh, helping to. Uh, protect the environment, keep our streets clean and safer. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we're doing all of that and freezing the council tax for a further year. Um, against the background of you know, 151 million pounds worth of cuts um, over the last five years, I think that's quite an achievement. Final point to make, um, uh, you know, I've, I've said this on many occasions, I believe another five years of austerity, I do believe that we are looking at the end of, of local government as we know it. Um, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that we have a change in May, um, but you know we need to uh, we need to get the message across about the damage that the, the reductions that we've had to make. We had to make some difficult decisions before Christmas. We had to make some difficult decisions in previous years. Um, I don't think if we have another five years of austerity, we, as, a, as the paragraph in the resolution says. I think it's going to be almost impossible to maintain even basic levels of public services going forward. And I say that with a huge amount of sadness because I serve as <coughs> local government to, to preside over the decline of, of our public services. So I do believe we need a change in May, but I think in the meantime we've done the best possible job we can as an administration to maintain public services for the people in the world and also maintain council tax at affordable and affordable. So with those comments, apologies I've gone on for so long, I'll, I'll formally move this resolution. Um, can I say a second? Second. Okay. Can I ask Kevin, can we agree that resolution? Agree. Okay, so that's a recommendation that will go from now <coughs> to budget council on the 24th of February. Um, and we'll obviously uh, have a, a further debate around these, these issues then. Uh, but I just want to say a big thank you, first of all, to um, Cabinet colleagues for the uh, really hard work they've done in, in many of these items, and also for the officers and support we have from officers to put this budget together. It's been a, a long and an arduous task, but I'm really pleased that we've uh, come up with the, uh, uh, the resolution we have tonight. So thanks to everyone concerned. Okay, so that's that uh, item three. That will be? Yeah, okay. Right, moving on to, um, I'll try and move fairly rapidly through the remainder of the agenda. Moving on to item four, which is the capital programme and financing 2015-18. Um, so I'm, I'm merely going to uh, move, move you to the recommendations on page 55, um, paragraph 13, that the uh, capital programme uh, has set out 
uh, in accordance with the capital monitoring regulations. Uh, the Council recommends the Budget Council uh, that we approve the capital programme for 1518 as detailed in Appendix 6. Okay, so um, can we move those recommendations, Captain? Thank you very much. Okay, that takes us on to item 5, the region term financial strategy, including treasury management strategy and capital strategy. The uh, medium term financial strategy is an important document that sets out how we will uh, meet our uh, financial uh, targets uh, over the next uh, three years and also links very closely to our, our corporate plan um, uh, set out in the, uh, in the detail uh, of the, of the uh, medium term financial strategy. And the strategy and um, so, uh, Again, not proposing that we, uh, we go into this in, in, in detail, um, but the recommendations are set out on page 78, uh, which you can see in paragraph 31, that we uh, approve the Treasury Management Strategy, the prudential indicators to be adopted, the Council's minimum revenue provision policy be approved, and the Council Officers listed in Appendix G be authorised to approve the payments from the Council Bank accounts. For treasury management activities at 13 to the medium term financial strategy be approved and that we have regular updates uh, reported to cabinets on, on that strategy. So, can I move those recommendations? I agree. Thank you very much. Okay, that takes us then on to some of our uh, routine uh, financial items. Item 6 is the uh, revenue report for month 9, page 155. Uh, again, I uh, don't want to uh, say much more than uh, I'm pleased that we've got the projected overspend down uh, for uh, uh, further month to uh, some 820,000, um, 850,000 last month. I'd just like to uh, uh, say that I, I want officers and cabinet members to continue to go down on the uh, overspend because we need uh, our aim is to come in with a balanced budget. So uh, I think that's the main message from, from this report. The detail is set out in the, uh, the tables in the report and the annex. But I'm, I'm simply going to uh, propose that we um, move the, uh, the recommendations on page 126, like, uh, paragraph 17, um, which is to, to note this report and to note the changes in budget allocations relating to the pay award, revised depreciation charges, remodeling savings, and note the risks relating to non delivery of savings in detail that you report. So, can we agree those recommendations, Kevin? Thank you very much. Uh, that takes us on to item uh, number seven, which is the financial monitoring report for the capital uh, program, month nine. Um, again, uh, <coughs> I don't want to highlight anything in particular except to say. Um, we need to, and I'm pleased to continue to uh, make progress on uh, our capital receipts on uh, sites and properties. I think that's pleasing. Um, the, the details are set out in, uh, in, in the report, but really, recommendation 18.1 is asking us to notice the spend of month 9, 22.5 million with through course of the financial year at that. So, can we, can we agree that recommendation? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, item 8 is a um, referral from Canada from the 9th of December. So just, just let note this, uh, so this, uh, this was just the uh, recommendation to, to, to Council on the 15th of December. Can we note that? Oh. Uh, minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Item 9 is a welfare reform update. Um, I've, I've referred to many of these items in the budget resolution. Um, I, I still remain of the view that I think the, the government's, some of the government's um, changes on welfare reform are misguided. I you know, continue to believe they got it wrong on bedroom tax. I continue to believe that their decision to axe the local welfare assistance fund was a mistake. And the latest blow is the discretionary housing pay uh, cut we only heard about literally uh, in the last uh, few days. Um, I worry about the uh, impact of universal credit. I'm not convinced that that is going to uh, be something that is uh, beneficial to our, our, our residents um, for reasons we talked about many times here in this, uh, this cabinet and council. 
This is a this report is primarily for us to note the um, the changes that we've we talked about. Um, we've got uh, um, so just look at recommendations of thirty. We, we're also being asked to transfer <coughs> seventy thousand to the DHP discretionary housing payment fund for this year to help them address the rent shortfalls. Um, I, I, I'm really pleased that we've agreed the 300,000 we've got for next year because um, I, I don't see any sign that the, uh, the impact of the, the benefit changes is, is helping in any way. So it's important that we, we, uh, that we make that uh, commitment. Do any members want to say anything to this? So Bernie and then Anne, Bernie first. <coughs> yeah, so I think it's really, really important that we sort of look at the callous effect of what this government are doing on the poorest people in society. While we protect vulnerable people, we do the very, very best we can with the legal means that we have these days to protect those vulnerable people. Things like um, the Welfare Assistance Fund is a crisis fund that was a national responsibility, not a local responsibility. They moved it over to us for one year and then they just pulled the rug from under our feet. Crisis loans don't necessarily mean that it goes to people who are in benefits. Anybody can find themselves in crisis. Anybody can find them, God forbid, that the house has burned down or that they may be done and all of a sudden and they can't afford to pay for their, for their house and their things. The crisis loan is there, is there to protect people in crisis. And everybody will find, find somebody within their wards or within their local communities in crisis. This was a national fund that's been taken. And once again, you're seeing through austerity, you're seeing the poorest people and the most vulnerable people in society paying for the mistakes of the bankers. And this government do not care <coughs> about poor people and do not care about vulnerable people. They protect their own while we pick up the pieces. And while our funds are being cut, as they are being cut, we're finding it harder and harder and harder to protect the most vulnerable. <coughs> we're doing the very, very best we can. And I'm glad to scream from the rafters about how disgraceful it is what the government is doing. And it's the same with the discretionary housing benefit. It's the poorest people in society who, who were affected by this and, protect, uh, uh, and the bedroom tax. Disabled people are affected by the, by the bedroom tax. It's ridiculous and I think something needs to be done, something needs to be said and I, say, I, hope, I hope the local press screen to say that we object as loud as we possibly can <coughs> to what the government have done with taking this £300,000 away from the discretionary housing and pulling all together the welfare assistance budgets. It's, it's Callous isn't the word and scandalous isn't the word, there isn't a way to describe how, how unfair this is. Thanks, Rob. Well, uh, as Laura has said, it's all but I think the, the position of this government is very clear. We've made the position absolutely clear. They've got no interest whatever in the poor and vulnerable <coughs> in our society. And it is their intention deliberately through their policy and the way that they transfer responsibility to us without the resources or means to deliver those services that they're just trying to again pass the book to local government already you know um, giving us uh, you know cutting 24 million from the rate support grant and giving us 616,000 or some kind of stop it's an absolute disgrace but they've made their position very clear on the poor and the vulnerable then you know then these are mean and nasty policies from a mean and nasty government literally and uh, you know the local welfare assistance and discretionary housing payments are those that really help those people who are in dire need, dire need, and uh, to not give us any funding to support that is absolutely disgraceful. Yeah. Totally agree. I think we should register our uh, our views to yeah. the government directly on this. Can, can I make a suggestion? Um, can I suggest that we add an, an additional recommendation to the report? Um, so it would be uh, thirty point uh, three. Um, but this, sorry, I haven't put it down. So. But this cabinet condemns the decision of the government to axe the grant for the local welfare assistance fund, yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. also to cut the uh, <coughs> discretionary housing payment grant, uh, as this will <coughs> impact on the, the poorest uh, people in the borough, and um, asks our um, MPs to make representations to the relevant minister to ask them to reverse these damaging cuts. Yeah. 
agree with Chris? I think, can we, can we agree with the recommendations? Yeah. They agree? Bernie, come back in. Yeah. Okay, um, it's back, so we'll move on then to uh, item number 12 of the Children and Family Services. And this is the school's budget for 2015-16. And uh, we'll ask Tony Smith to move this, please. Okay, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, taking account of the advice of the school's forum, forum I think the Cabinet is recommended to agree a school's budget for 2015-16 of $243 million. This has been a complex budget, bringing together a number of discussions with schools and forum members during the year on PFI savings of 2.3 million, changes in the school funding formula, and changes in the number of special school places and high needs costs. The overall funding for schools is maintained in cash terms with an adjustment reflecting changes in pupil numbers. However, there is no provision for growth meaning that the additional costs resulting from pay awards and increased pension contributions will have to be absorbed by schools together with any other increases in costs. This will, will present significant challenges to some schools. And only last week, uh, Chair, the uh, Tory government uh, announced what the funding will be for next year, and that uh, is going to be a 10% decrease in funding I think with a big fanfare initially uh, saying that we're protecting school budgets, but when people actually examined it, discovered that it um, wouldn't be asking <coughs> for an increase in inflation or pay awards or, uh, and, and that. So that oh, is an overall 10% decrease in, in, in the school's budget. And it just contrasts that really with, um, <coughs> we had a, there was a discussion nationally about two months ago about the uh, subsidy that's given to private schools, and I think it was something like 140 million uh, and that. And I haven't noticed that that subsidy is going to be decreased by 10%. So, you know, we're actually subsidizing the very rich people, possibly the people who had some of these bank accounts in, you know, Switzerland or Luxembourg or whatever. So, it's it, it, a ridiculous position, really. Um, can I sort of say that limited growth has been included has been has been included in the budget for increases in high needs uh, and changes in special and school places are also proposed from September for Kilgard and the Observatory School five places each and Elwood Park and Stanley nine places each. Um, again, some school formula adjustments are recommended. These again have been supported by schools and the schools forum. I think that's very important the discussion that went on there. The change in next year will increase the funding for the children. We have the, the unit value of the free school meal to adjust the funding for alternative provision. Uh, pupil premium, which is estimated at 18 million and includes a new amount payable to early years providers, was early years budgets to growing growth in provision for two-year-olds. Just at this stage, I'd just like to mention that um, in the last week or so, we had a, a letter from the Education Minister, David Laws, um, who um, has written to eight of our primary schools who have um, been uh, operating, well, who have um, operated the pupil premium praising them for the efficient and effective way they've operated the pupil premium for disadvantaged uh, pupils and that. I think mean, that's a really good you know, sort of use of pupil premium. And with 18 million, we are monitoring it very, very carefully with the local authority to ensure that the most disadvantaged children are you know, sort of, uh, 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 getting the, the best outcomes from that. Again, I would like to say that overall, the budget help to maintain rural schools excellent standards, results and outcome for, for our children and that. And finally, can I just say that we've just had uh, uh, the, the most recent uh, 
reports on the, uh, <coughs> the GCSE results in, in, in the authority, the children receiving five A to C's, including maths and English. And um, we are first amongst our statistical neighbours, which is excellent, an excellent result for uh, what our schools and teachers are doing, but also for the officers who work with the schools. And um, in the northwest, we are second, um, we, 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 just behind Trafford and that. So, you know, despite changes that are being made in that, it's excellent work from, from, from our officers and excellent work from our teachers, head teachers, and all the other people who work in our schools. Um, can I just say that the recommendation is asking to accept the recommendation on page 257, um, taking account of the views of the school forum, and we agree those um, eight recommendations. Do you want me to go through them? No, that's okay. So, um, I, was just, I was just going to... Uh, <coughs> I, was just, I was just going to echo your... Um, Thanks to all the teachers and uh, support staff and governors and, and our um, local authority officers for the excellent results that we, uh, we achieved um, uh, in the um, you know, recent um, tests and exams. I think uh, you know, we continue to, uh, to generally be an excellent authority for our uh, school, school achievement. So I, I'd just like to add my thanks to your praise for, for the, all the people <coughs> So, um, the, the recommendation, uh, you can see printed in paragraph 16, Tony's uh, moved that, those recommendations. Can Cabinet agree then? They agree? Okay, thanks, Tony. Right, uh, item 13, I'm going to do part for this item. Can I take a Collaboration agreement between Wilk Council 
the check and the chamber to deliver all business support services from the borough. Um, secondly, the head of the from Democratic Conservatives is to a legal collaboration to counsel the chamber uh, upon the content of the report. Thank you. Uh, can we agree that recommendation? Yeah. Yeah. Programme, the Roads and Footways uh, Structural Maintenance Programme also takes into account 
the, the views of local board councillors and the locally based highways inspectors um, regarding no maintenance concerns. Appendix 2 sets out the proposed uh, programme, the extension of that programme. Uh, we noted that the, the list in the Appendix 2 actually is greater than the £3.7 million uh, public proposal. This is to allow the um, schemes that may be disrupted due to uh, utility works or where schemes can be to below estimated cost. If approved, this administration will be investing £1 million of council money into our highways network, uh, benefits and jobs and growth. I commend the recommendations as set out on the page. Here are two Okay, thanks, uh, Stuart. Oh, you can you give me a favour to do one minute off? Sorry. Sorry. Okay, can I just add a couple of things? I mean, I think <coughs> the, the uh, recommendations would be agreed. Um, first of all, just to reiterate, I'm really pleased that we're putting in £1 million of our additional council money in addition to the government, what the government is getting us. That's a, a recognition of the importance of our highways network to the borough. Can I also uh, just make a point about the, uh, the letter that we've had from the, uh, from the uh, government on page 305? about the allocations, this is part of transport, the allocations to the regions uh, of funding. And, you know, don't know, don't know the detail behind this, but, you know, how can I say this is yet again another example of the south um, uh, of England getting a huge amount of money, much more than uh, regions in the north. Um, and, you know, I, I just think there may be a rational explanation, but I'm suspicious that yet again the government is uh, targeting the lion's share of this, this important funding to go to areas of the south of England. <coughs> you know, the, the need, we know the needs of our highways infrastructure in the, in the north of England. And yet again, uh, you know, we seem to have lost out to the south. So, I, you know, I, I just want to recall my concern, another example of, of basically what would be Discriminating against really, in terms of funding yeah. needs. We need to register that. Yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, but I think that is, that, is a, that is a sort of serious issue. It's obviously it's, it's repeated in many other funding uh, pots as well. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but anyway, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, Stuart, um, the, the, the key recommendations, the ones you've moved yeah. in, in item in recommendations, in paragraph 13 on page 302. Um, so can we uh, agree those recommendations? Can we? Thanks very much. Okay, and um, I think finally uh, we're going to item 16 of the neighbourhood housing and engagement, which is the proposed changes to the fees charged for I think that should be adaptation um, delivered uh, delivered funded by the disabled <coughs> facilities grant. George, will you take us through this report, please? The purpose of the report is to seek the endorsement of government to increase the fees applied for uh, the delivery of the home adaptations funded through disabled facilities grants. Disabled facilities grants are made available for essential adaptations to give disabled people better freedom of movement into and around their homes and to give access to essential facilities within the home. Council award a disabled facilities grant to fund or part fund the cost of adaptations to assist residents who are not able to fund the work for themselves and the authority plays a facilitating role in delivering <coughs> adaptations funded by the, by the disabled facilities grant. The legislation provides for the local authorities to charge for such preliminary and ancillary services necessary to ensure the delivery of the most appropriate adaptation. Fees charged to clients who qualify for the DFG following a means test are met from the grant allocation. Therefore, only those clients who are required to make a contribution will be affected by the proposal contained within this report. We can advise that the majority of applicants qualify for the grant. Internal audit report dated 28th of March 2013 provided a recommendation as a formal review benchmarking against other authorities. In addition to the benchmarking exercise, a review has also been carried out to ensure that the proposed fees are based on a percentage of the value of work. The 
the staffing and resource costs of delivering the adaptations was considered as part of this exercise. It is proposed that we increase the fees for the current charge of 7% for works over 10,000 and 10% 10 for works under 10,000 to a standard charge of 11.5% for all works to a maximum value of £30,000. This is in line with the findings of the review and the recommendations are the Cabinet agrees and recommends to Council for full, full approval <coughs> that the fees associated with the provision of home adaptations as funded through disabled facilities grants be increased to 11.5% from the 1st of April 2015. I'll Okay, thanks, uh, thanks George. And I think you just need to note that that is below the um, benchmarked industry standard. Um, and we've seen, uh, if you can see in paragraph in section four, of the, um, the charges elsewhere. So it's good that we're, we're under the average. So thanks for that, George. So, Cabinet, can we agree to that recommendation? Is that yeah. agree? Okay, I've not been notified of any other business. Um, so, can I thank everybody for their attendance and close the meeting?